Pat and Dana have served wonderfully well. And what they will bring to the Oasis Church and what they will bring uh, to the movement of some of the new churches we're seeking to plant in Europe through Sovereign Grace pastors, what they will bring to those pastors in relationship is going to be, uh, I think, exceptional. Uh, the, the support that they will need is substantial to live in an international city uh, quite a bit. Uh, so we encourage you to prayerfully consider if God would have you uh, support them uh, through uh, special giving beyond your, your regular giving to the church, but that if you would give regularly to be a part of support team. Uh, yeah, it, for them to, to go to everyone, you know, is this something you would be interested in to do is, is a difficult thing on many levels. So uh, consider that and reach out to them. Uh, if you have questions or if you think God would be moving you in that way, uh, be praying that they would receive all that they need uh, and that we would be a, a part of it. And be praying for what you can imagine, all sorts of challenges uh, personally, uh, bureaucratically, in, in making a move like this, and be praying for your church. That is a big gap for us. So we need grace. In our members meeting at the end of the month, there'll be more updates from Eric, from Pat and Dana, talking about leadership of filling these holes. So there's a lot uh, to bring up to you. So do your best to be a part of that. Turning your Bibles to Genesis chapter 24. Uh, a little bit of trivia, this is the longest chapter in the book of Genesis. I'll just let that hang for a moment as you think of what could be implications of preaching on the longest chapter. And we'll see at the end of our time if there's any correlation to that. has questions about how do we move forward with life. Students are weighing decisions. Where, where do I go to college? That's, that's a big decision for a young person to think through. What are career decisions? What do I do with my life? Uh, maybe you're a supervisor where you work and you're trying to figure out how to handle the breakdown that's going on between employees. Uh, financial decisions. Tomorrow is tax day. And on top of everything else, you're just not sure how it's going to work. Maybe you're, you're a young couple and the thought, how do we buy a house? Right now seems impossible. Possible. If you're in school as a young person, just navigating friend issues, where you fit in, the, a question that fits with the text, who do you marry if that's still ahead of you? Maybe you're a wife facing the simmering tensions at home. How do I progress? We all have to regularly work through how do we move forward with life questions. As Christians, that question is sharpened in a more specific way. How can I be faithful to God in this situation? Answering this crucial question is at the heart of our passage. How do we move forward with 
vital life decisions that need to be made. We're not sure what to do. How do we go forward in a way that honors God? So turn, if you have, in Genesis 24, beginning in verse 1. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to you or offspring, I will give this land, he will send his angel before you. You shall take a wife for my son from there. Drop down to verse 10. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. He made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. He said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I'm standing by the spring of water. And the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, drink and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, this wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar from her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water, and she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing ten gold shekels and said, Please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, We have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way of the house of my master's kinsmen. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban. Laban ran out toward the man to the spring. As soon as he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms and heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, thus the man spoke to me, he went to the man. Behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. He said, come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? 
For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. Now drop down to verse 50. Then Laban and Bethuel answered, The thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you, good or bad. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go. Let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed to the earth before the Lord. The servant brought out jewelry of silver and gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave to her brother and her mother costly ornaments. He and the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. Her brother and her mother said, let the young woman remain with us for a while, at least 10 days. After that, she may go. But he said to them, do not delay me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. They said, let us call the young woman and ask her. And they called her back and said to her, will you go with this man? She said, I will go. Our Heavenly Father, these events which happened thousands of years ago, and yet you, you were in them, you had these events recorded for us to see and to hear and to consider. For you are deeply concerned for us and we need your concern. We need to understand you that we might entrust ourselves to you well. So we ask for your grace on each one of us here in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The main point from, for our, our time together today is this. Our faithfulness rests upon God's faithfulness. Our faithfulness, it has the most wonderful foundation that God is always being faithful to us. And as we consider the, the challenges in being faithful, uh, part of what we're to see is we can keep coming back to God is already being faithful to me. That is why we can be faithful. But what does this look like? So from our passage, I want to draw out five thoughts that help us understand what it looks like for us to be faithful by resting in the faithfulness of God. The first is this. Our life and our decisions belong to God. Our life and our decisions they belong to God. Abraham was, was deeply concerned about his son and the progression of his descendants as God had promised that he would make a mighty nation through them. Abraham had waited a long time. He was 100 when Isaac was born, but now Isaac is 40 and he's not even married. How will Isaac have a line? And what are the options that we have around us? How will God's promise be fulfilled? And it's a, a wondrous, mighty promise. It's not just a promise, God will be good to Abraham. It is that the nations of the world will be blessed through your descendants. It is a promise whose roots go back to the moment when Adam and Eve sinned against God and he promised to Eve that he would raise up from her line one who would overcome sin and deliver his people. To the world, the answer to Isaac's 
problem to Abraham's concern was very easy. You're a prosperous family. There's lots of women around uh, who would be very glad to be wedded to your wealthy son. It's not a big deal. It's not hard. But Abraham knows his future belongs to God. His future belongs to the purposes of God. This, this very foundational truth, our life belongs to God, is one that is the opposite of how the world thinks. We're surrounded by thinking which is that my life is my own. That sentiment is so strongly embedded in the hearts that do not love God, it goes so far that my life is my own is actually used to justify the killing of innocent children in a mother's womb. Because what is the argument given? This is my body. The claiming rule over our own body is so strong, even though this, this child with a separate heartbeat, a separate name, uh, its own soul is sacrificed because it's living in my body, and I rule over that. That is how far this clinging to ourselves, being in charge, is to the human soul. That people would openly and zealously and aggressively uphold what is inexcusable and unthinkable. Isaac cannot take a wife from among the Canaanite people surrounding them. The Lord had said back in chapter 9 that the line of the Canaanites coming from hand that the curse of God was upon that line. God was not going to honor that line. God will save from it but God would not honor that line. It is unfaithful. The closest family to Abraham and Isaac, the kindreds from which Isaac could find a wife, the, the kindreds around them, that's Lot's family. And that family is a sordid mess. It, if Lot had stayed where he was from, it actually could have been Lot's descendants that Isaac married because it was Lot's brother that Rebekah comes from. Abraham shows his commitment is to God by refusing to compromise. He simply will not do it. To Abraham, it's, it, it's not one of the options before us. He is insistent in two matters. Abraham's wife must not come from the Canaanites, and, and Isaac, or Isaac's wife must not come from the Canaanites, and Isaac must not go back and leave the land. For the promise of God, the covenant of God, was for the descendants and for the land. Abraham was committed to that. So our, our first understanding of what does it mean to be faithful to God in, in our situations is to recognize that we belong to God. And so our decisions belong to God. And then working directly from that, number two, our steps and decisions, they must start with what is most honoring to God. What do we do first? what would honor God. That, that's what directs the first step we take. Abraham knows what the faithful option is. 
he must find a, a wife for his son from among his kindred. But that has challenges. The first is that the distance is anywhere from 800 to 1,200 miles round trip on a camel. It's not an easy journey. And as Abraham's servant points out, you know, this, this woman you're talking about, this theoretical woman whose name you can't give me, what if she doesn't want to leave? And what if her family hears this and says, we're not sending her to who knows where? There are a lot of challenges to what is the only option. So where does Abraham start? He starts for asking for an oath from his servant. Verse 2, Abraham said to his servant, the old of his household, who had charge of all he had, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. In other words, Abraham starts with making sure that the answer to the concern, it, the answer is either going to be faithfulness to God or fail. There's, there's not an in-between, well, God might not mind this, or this kind of is obeying God. Abraham's already lived through those kinds of decisions. Abraham's committed to, we will be faithful to God or this will fail. There, there's no other option I will take or that I will accept. Now, the whole thing of the servant putting his hand under the, the thigh, what's all, all that about? Remember what the sign of the covenant was? The sign of the covenant God had made was circumcision. So by the servant putting his hand under Abraham's thigh, he's putting his hand next to where the sign of the covenant is. Uh, what that tells us is Abraham is, is thinking of this. The, the oath he's taking, the decision we're making is all connected to this reality. This is about God. This is about God's covenant, God's calling God's mercy we believe God's faithfulness this is a need we have we're not sure exactly what to do but this we know it's about God we will be faithful to the covenant of God and so the steps we take will be based on what will honor the covenant the best we know how the servant starts by placing his success in God's hands. Verse 12, when he arrives after hundreds of miles and weeks of traveling, oh, Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success. Show steadfast love to my master. The servant, he can't even be fully sure he's where he's supposed to be. Or what's going to happen? Who am I looking for? What do I communicate? What, what house do I start knocking on? Where do I go from here? And he calls for the Lord to be present because I'm not sure what to do. I've done what I can. I've come here. What happens now? Now, the servant arrived with considerable human leverage. He came with a lot of wealth. In verse 22, where it says he, he put a gold ring on Rebecca's finger and, and two bracelets, the, the cost of just the gold is over $9,000. And he had other things with him. He, he had what in our world is leverage. And yet, 
that's not what he was resting on. Let me find the biggest house and let me let them know what my master has and let's work something out. Lord, I need you to show up and lead what steps to take. He also wants this to be what God does here matter. Do you believe that your life belongs to God? If you're here this morning, most likely you would say, yes, of course. The follow-up question then is, do your decisions show that you believe your life belongs to God? The third principle we see, the first, our life belongs to God, so our decisions do. Secondly, our steps and decisions and start, well, what would honor God most? Here are the options, what most honors God. Third, we can then trust God will provide what we need to be faithful. What is it? that we need in order to be faithful to God, he will supply that, what we need to be faithful. Abraham, he didn't know how God would guide his servant, but he knew God. And so in verse 7, he could say, the God of heaven who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, God who came to me, God who spoke to me, that God will go before you. During seasons that were heavy for me, feeling God's not doing what seems so desperately needed. In the heaviest times, I would often go back in my mind to the, the earliest stories I could remember my parents telling of God's faithfulness to them and uh, stories of, of the church and how God met needs. And I, I would remember what I witnessed as I was a child, God being faithful. And then through, through years, I, I would just work through all that I had heard or witnessed of God being faithful. So when I got to my then moment, I could have confidence this God will not stop being faithful now or to me. This is the God I am seeking, depending on. The servant knew that his task was based on the promises of God. These weren't things they were making up. God had made promises. God had made covenant. He was acting out of, let's be faithful to covenant with God, but he also knew his limitations. I don't know who, I can't make anyone come back with me. He knew God, he knew his limitations, and so he wouldn't go forward without God directing him. Oh Lord, Grant me success. Behold, you see where I am. Let the young woman to whom I say, please let down your jar that I may drink. She'll respond, drink and your camels as well. Let that be the one. He is seeking God to intervene to give direction. This is an important truth for us to leave carrying with us. God does not expect us to be him. God calls us to depend upon 
him. He's not expecting you to have all the answers, to know everything. He's not expecting you to have strength that holds up every problem. He doesn't expect you to be able to make people follow your will. He doesn't expect you to have control over the events of the world. God will be God, and he calls us to depend on him who is God and not try to be a mini God herself. And don't try to pull that upon yourself or burden yourself with what God has never asked you to carry. How wonderful for little ones to start learning. Amen, yes, God. Now, where do you suppose Abraham's servant learned to trust in the God of heaven and earth? Where did that come from? It came from watching and listening to Abraham seeing Abraham fall, he, he was the longest of his servants. He, he had seen Abraham in all sorts of days, including some real failures. But he saw God sustain and, and Abraham respond. He learned God is trustworthy by those with whom he lived. How did I walk through the stories of faithfulness of my past because I heard my parents share that and saw them walk through those days. And as I learned it, I at some early point began to take some of my own steps and learning for myself. Yes, he is faithful, trustworthy God. The lifestyle of trusting God in our challenges will prepare others to do the same. So what is the lifestyle? that trust in the Lord? Well, there's a lot we could say. Let me narrow it down two categories. One would be that we fully engage with the means of grace God has given us, all of them. To be faithful to God means we engage with what God has given us. He has given us his word to cling to, to know, to trust. He's, he's giving us the privilege to talk with him, to interact with him. He's given us his church to stand with us, to, to know us, to be made aware of need and to share that with us. He's, he's given us particular ministries and categories with which, like the brunch today, to connect with other parents as we face the challenges of parenting, uh, the, the grace of being in community. There, there are the, the graces God has given his people. We, we have a lifestyle of faithfulness by embracing them all as fully as we can. The second category then is that our trust in God includes our attitude. A lifestyle of faithfulness is an attitude that's not complaining and accusing, always whining, though some may come out of us. Our attitude is part of trusting. It's part of showing how much we believe God is faithful. 
a lifestyle of faithfulness is one that's not just about ourselves. As important that, as that is, it's also about those whom we care about and pray for. God's providential response to the servant is the high point of the passage. Verse 15, before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah. And just as he asked, when he asked of her, asked of God, when he asked of her for water, she didn't stop with giving him a drink, but may I water your camels as well. Now, this brings up the whole category of asking God for signs for direction. I mean, he, he does do this here. He, he asks for a sign. Is, is that what we're supposed to do? And God at times gives signs. He does hear. Uh, I, we have to be careful about wanting to rely on signs. Uh, usually, God calls us to do our best with what he's given us and to trust what he will do. There are times, though, when God does give signs. There have been many times in my life where I felt an impression is God leading and I've asked for some kind of sign, which the overwhelming majority of the times is it's, there's no sign and that was just an impression. I, I remember one time in college as I was on my way, I think to the library, I'm just assuming that because where else would I be going as a college student? <laughs> So I was on my way to intense study at the library, and I walked past the prayer chapel. It was across the street from my dorm where I would um, have my devotions. As I was walking past, I had the strong impression to go in. And you know, I kept walking, and the impression continued. And it felt so strong. I said, Lord, if, if you're telling me to go in, then... As I'm walking across this lawn, you're going to make my books fall to the ground. So I just keep walking, and I, about 50 yards later, I, oh, my shoe's untied. So as I am tying my shoes, I'm looking at my books that I put on the ground. So I went back. And I went in, and there was a, a student there, a young lady who I knew a little bit, who had a, a very specific question uh, that I had an answer to. I could tell her the answer, and, and it was a simple thing, and then she left. And uh, that's not something that's happened a lot. It was, there was an urgency in the moment Whatever her need was, what she did with that information, I don't know. Uh, I know this, as she was praying, the Spirit took her prayers and reached out and pulled me in as an answer to her prayers. It's not always that way, but God is always faithful. The Lord does call us followers. We're followers of Christ, which means he will lead. He will lead us. He will guide us. Now, most of God's leading is in a means that gives us great confidence, his word, which we can go to, we can memorize, we can read every day, we're not just trusting what people are saying and telling us. There it is. God said it to us. So God leads us most emphatically uh, and foundationally through his word, and that is always authoritative. Now, the Holy Spirit, who is the one who gave the word, also speaks at times in, in specificity that the word does not always give. So he does speak to us. It's, it's not 
as authoritative as the Word of God, not because he is less authoritative, but because we can be a little squirrely in how we interpret. Uh, It's our weakness, not his, why the written Word is always more authoritative than what we think may be his voice and what sometimes is. And here we can always know The Holy Spirit who gave the word will never speak anything to us that contradicts the word. He's the same spirit. He's he's not confused. He doesn't forget. Now, one more statement of clarification about using God's word. Sometimes God's word is prescriptive. It's prescribing, telling us clearly what we are to be and do. Sometimes the word of God is descripting. Descriptive, it's telling us what happened. This is a descriptive passage. It is not God's prescribed way to find a spouse. I suggest you never put your hand under anyone's thigh. Under any circumstances. It's just one, it's like asking a woman if she's pregnant. It's just, there's never a time. There's never a time when it's appropriate. I told some in the church, there's gonna be a, a point in the sermon that's for you. You will know this is God's truth for you. There are a lot of elements to this story that okay, this is what you do to find a wife. Now, $9,000 worth of jewelry probably wouldn't hurt. (laughs) It might get you at least a couple dates, but we're, we're not having to us something prescribed, we're having a description of this is what God did. Uh, the, God, the Word of God does prescribe to us truth about s- important decisions. Uh, in 1 Corinthians seven thirty nine, the Apostle Paul speaks of widows, of being remarried, and he says, marry whoever you wish, but in the Lord. So you have the freedom to, to marry someone that you want to, uh, but There is a prescription. It it must be another believer. So the scripture prescribes truth for us, and it describes the way he works. And we learn from all of it, but we need to keep separate what is just described and what is prescribed. Biblical decision-making involves using the whole Bible to guide us. So far, the the idea of finding a spouse, uh, oh, who does God want me to marry? And someone in the Lord, but someone who shows the fruit of faith. Not a young man who says, oh, yeah, I accepted Christ at church last Sunday. And we'll go to church with you as long as he has to to get what he wants. I've seen that. Many, many times, as soon as the commitment's made, never see him again. Uh, Do you see the fruit of someone who actually loves God? Is there evidence of that? Does this person help you in how you mature? Or are you fighting against pulling you away from the things of God? The descriptions of The book of Proverbs is describing the fool and the wise. There's lots of insight there. This is how foolishness operates. This is how God's wisdom operates. This is how the character looks like. Are they building on on foundation of rock or sand? There's lots of truths of scripture that we together are being informed what would be a wise decision about someone to commit my life to? The Bible's filled with those truths to guide us. The fourth principle we want to bring up is that faithfulness to God is intentional for God, meaning don't neglect our part. 
faithfulness to God is intentional toward him. Abraham prepares through an oath and through what he gives the servant to take with him. He does his best so that when a servant arrives, this family will know Isaac has the means to take care of your daughter. We, you can be confident of where, what she's getting herself into. The, the servant is committed to not being distracted or delayed. After the agreement comes, and they're saying, well, just stay for a while. And what's translated stay at least 10 days? Uh, the literal word is just 10. It, it's kind of vague. 10 what? Just stay for a while is really what they say. And, and we'll find out with Laban later on what that can look like. But we see the servant says, no, do not delay me. The Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go. He will not be distracted. He will not be delayed. And even Rebecca, she has no idea what's going to happen that day. She's just going about her tasks. She doesn't know where she is at a key moment in God's plan and purposes for her life. Uh, this is what she knows. This is how I live. This is how I act. This is what I do. If a request is made, this is how I respond. And her response is much more earnest than we might recognize. Her offer to water the camels is extravagant. Uh, there are 10 camels. A camel will drink, if it's fully thirsty, a camel will drink 25 gallons apiece, 250 gallons. The, the jars of water had two to three gallons in it. Figure out how many trips that is. That could be 100 trips. 100, that's a couple hours of pulling up water. That's not just get something poured in, we're done. This is a couple hours extra hard work. And, and notice how she goes about it. She quickly let him her jar. Verse 20, she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well. We have this sense of her, not even know what's going on, a sense of urgency that, that matches the urgency that the servant had knowing what was going on, and, and God connects them to show God is in the midst of all of it. God is orchestrating, bringing together those who know what they're doing, those who don't know. God's bringing it together for what he knows and is doing. Her, her actions show she's in the will of God, even though she doesn't know what God is doing. Throughout the chapter, we see human responsibility and God's sovereignty tied together. They're not equal, but they're tied together. And the last point is really just a summary statement. Our faithfulness will reveal God's goodness. Our faithfulness will reveal God's goodness. This is how the passage ends. And Isaac, verse 63, went out to meditate in the field toward the evening. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted, comforted after his mother's death. It's like a Hallmark movie. <laughs> there were uncertainties and challenges for everyone in this story but they all experienced the goodness of God because they didn't compromise, because they're faithful. So be encouraged that your faithfulness rests 
on the reality that God is always faithful. We're not always going to make perfect decisions. We can always make God-honoring decisions. Let's pray.